So today, I would like to discuss a very fascinating angle of uh, this uh, watchmaker research that I'm conducting. Now, um, in the history of the Montanan watch dynasty, there is an issue in that most of these uh, achievements were affected before the advent of photography. And therefore, as a result, there are very few uh, pictures available, uh, at least uh, that we can f locate, uh, but there are very few uh, images of these watchmakers. And uh, this is mainly uh, because most of this activity was uh, unfolding up until 1880. However, after 1880, we, there was a continuation. Nevertheless, the pictures of these watchmakers are extremely scarce. So I would like to uh, show this small um, slideshow, which I think you'll find interesting. Now, this uh, will discuss uh, or focus on um, several of the key individuals, their affiliations, that is, their daughters, sons, and uh, grandchildren, uh, occasionally a brother. Uh, however, um, in some cases, we will actually have a watchmaker's own image, and this is extremely rare. These are, these can be counted on one hand uh, due to the nature of the uh, uh, situation. Uh, so let us begin. We have uh, this uh, Pierre Frederic Montandon, uh, who lived from 1760, uh, died uh, probably after 1834. Now we do have this painting of Julie Montandon uh, Dubois, and she she is the daughter of Pierre Frederic. Now Pierre Frederic was a monteur de bottes and a finisseur, and he uh, probably around 1793 moved to Besançon uh, to be part of a colony of Swiss watchmakers who. Uh, were making watches at a factory, which was a Jacobin project in France under uh, Laurent Megadon. And uh, so we do find uh, for approximately a decade, many of these Swiss families are working at this, uh, this factory. Now this factory eventually w uh, w lost money uh, and uh, th many of the families returned uh, to the native country. Now uh, this uh, daughter of his, this Julie Montandon, would have been around three years old when the family was living there. However, she did return to La Chaux des Fonds and she married Auguste Ferre Gentil, dit Maillard. Now, uh, it's not exactly clear what his profession was. Was he also in the watch trade? Uh, this is not um, evident to us. Now, the genealogical branch that we're discussing here is Montandon Bratzel, and uh, probably it is very highly likely that Julie participated uh, with the family uh, work and probably did some finissage uh, in her younger years. This was quite uh, common in these cottage industry uh, times and uh, so we can expect that she did have uh, contact with the watch industry. This painting dates from 1835 and it should be noted that uh, this is not the only painting of Montandans, uh, in, in particular, of watchmaking Montandans. There are several portraits done by the Swiss painter. Uh, uh, this is Leopold Robert, who, who is extremely well known. He is a very famous uh, Swiss painter. And he was on friendly terms with Charles Montandon of La Chaux de Fonds, who also ventured to Paris. His son, Jules Henri Montandon, was involved with uh, the watch. Uh, in Clock Springs with Montana and Ferris. He uh, presented these springs at the New York Exhibition in 1853, 1854. So uh, we do see both Charles and uh, Jules uh, later uh, in collaboration with their uh, cousins in Paris and later in out of Loche de Fonds. So uh, now let us move to the next image. Now, Balthazar Montandon is one of our early 18th century 
watch and clock makers. He immigrated to France originally at Clermont and was partnering with Andre Elfen. Now, unfortunately, we do not have a uh, picture of him. He died in 1839. And uh, both of his sons uh, eventually went to occupy singular uh, professions. Uh, one was a minister uh, very high in the administration of the Le Post, and he was dealing with franchises. This is uh, Alexis. Uh, Annette Alexis Montandon, now his brother and Balthasar's son, Auguste Laurent, who is pictured here, is the son of Balthasar. This is the Blaise Leon branch. Now, um, it is very possible that through the sun we can picture what Balthasar may have looked like. This is a very um, um, reasonable baseline. It's not always the case, however, there generally is some family semblance. So, through the sun, we do have a window into a general idea about Balthazar, how he looked. Uh, so uh, it should be mentioned also, and this picture dates from approximately the 1850s, uh, many of these people that we will be seeing uh, received some sort of uh, titles. And uh, in the case of Balthazar's other son, uh, Annette Alexis, he was made a knight. Uh, uh, of the Legion of Honor, Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, and we see this very frequently, especially with the uh, Montandon Blaise Leon family members, that they did achieve these heights in the society. So let us continue. Now, in this same line, uh, under Balthasar, now we have his son, Alexis, that is, Annette Alexis, uh, would have given birth to uh, another son, Claude Louis, and Claude Louis gave birth to, or rather his wife gave birth to, uh, this uh, other, Achille Auguste Louis Diet George. Now, his son, that would be the great-great-grandson of Balthazar, was Louis Montandon. Now, this is a picture of Louis Montandon from either the late 1950s or uh, 1960s, and both this Louis Montandon and his father, uh, George, uh, or Achille Auguste Louis, called George, they were both bankers, and they were both bankers under the firm of uh, Credit Lyonnais, and they were heading the chapters there in Brus Brussels. Now, this Louis was also heading the chapter of Strasbourg, and uh, these are very interesting individuals. Both of these uh, individuals, the great-grandson and the great-great-grandson of Balthazar became Knights of the Legion of Honor in France. So these these are very uh, interesting. Now they uh, were also very rich and powerful. They aspired quite high. Um, we see this is the house that both Achille Auguste Louis, all called George, and his son Louis Montandon owned. This is the Chateau de Belin. Uh, in uh, Aisne uh, region in France, and this is uh, in, in the community of Bain, and a uh, very large, very lush uh, uh, villa or uh, castle, even if you would like to call it, it's a manor house. And uh, we see that uh, George, the um, father of Louis, had a very large book collection, which it was enormous. And uh, we see the mark of the pedigree, uh, uh, the Montana family crest in, his, uh, in the books of his library. And uh, these are often uh, materializing in various sales and auctions on the internet. But uh, it also should be, should be pointed out that uh, the, there are watchmaker connections uh, with Louis's father, uh, George. Now, George was involved as a jury member in several of the expositions, uh, world expositions. So he was very um, uh, well known for this. And uh, the uh, fact that he was a very big collector of genealogical information, uh, specifically on the Montanans of La Ravine, and he has uh, published a 600 year uh, history which is retained 
by the archives of Neuchâtel. And this is very helpful, much early information on, on the Montana genealogy. So let us move on to our next watchmaker. Now, Henri Louis uh, Montanvin was uh, originally in, in Switzerland, however, by around 1817, he did move to Copenhagen, Denmark. It's not exactly clear under what circumstances he moved, but he did open up his own business there. Uh, now, Henri Louis is a big watchmaker in the history of the Montandon watch dynasty. He was uh, a master watchmaker, and he was making uh, watches and clocks, and these objects are appearing uh, very infrequently, but they are noticeable at auctions these days. And uh, now this uh, Henri Louis also uh, spent time uh, approximately five years uh, prior to his uh, master watchmaker status studying in Paris. And it's highly likely that he was apprenticing at Montenefers in the early years. This is not exactly watertight, but it does seem that this is a high likelihood. Now, once again, this is a branch of the Blaisleon family, and so it would have been very, uh, very um, uh, highly likely, highly plausible that he was with the cousins, with the very close cousins, at Montenefers um, in Paris. Now his son, who is pictured here, François-Louis Montandon, was born in Copenhagen. He later moved to Switzerland, married, and eventually uh, immigrated to the United States. And he was also a watchmaker, and he is also uh, known uh, as Francis Louis Montandon, or Francis Louis Watchmaker Montandon. And uh, he eventually uh, immigrated to Tennessee, and uh, this picture is most likely between the 1860s to 1870s. Uh, but it does give us a very good picture of this Blaisleyan group. And once again, we may have a picture uh, into the uh, face of Henri Louis. Uh, so this is, this is a rare picture uh, in that we have a watchmaker pictured here. Let us move to the next. We have another Henri Louis. Montandon. Now this Henry Louis Montandon is not a place Leon. He is of the genealogical branch of Montandon de Travers. Now this Henri Louis may have collaborated with uh, Montandon first. Um, he, he moved from Switzerland to Besançon and, uh, in 1850 and he began to work with a company. He established Montandon and Co. with two other Swiss colleagues. Uh, now within nine years just under 10 years, the other colleagues uh, evaporated for reasons that are not clear. However, it is possible that Henri Louis was making either watch movements or parts or even whole watches for uh, Montana for us. This is not exactly clear whether this was Japi Effis or was it actually Henri Louis Montana. However, um, he also has uh, under his name uh, at least eight uh, patents, inven inventions that he uh, concocted and actually uh, Henri Louis was supplying watches to uh, Leroy of Paris who earlier in their history were uh, watchmakers to the kings of France. Uh, he also supplied watches to the magistrates of France and to the railroads. But uh, pictured here uh, we have Arnold Lucien, who was the son of Henri Louis, and uh, this uh, son, once again, uh, we have a very face that can, uh, this is very uh, um, associated with the Montana de Traverse branch, and uh, my brother <laughs> looks almost exactly like uh, Arnold Lucien in, in certain pictures. You can see the family resemblance here. Now, this uh, uh, Arnold Lucien uh, may have done some watchmaking in, in the early years before, in, in the 1870s, before, early 1870s, before um, he left, and he left approximately 1873 for uh, Romania. Now, he became the royal estate manager for the king uh, of Romania, King Carol I. However, uh, he did this for many, many, many years. Uh, he had a long career with the king uh, as a real estate manager in various different parts of Romania. 
uh, and uh, Transylvania and uh, just all over in all of the provinces. Now he is most known for his entomological and malacological discoveries. Uh, Arnold Lucien is a world famous uh, bug expert who discovered over 544 taxa, uh, different, uh, in, in different species. So this is, uh, in families, this is very interesting. He, he um, is quoted everywhere, has been everywhere, he has traveled all of the continents, and uh, he is very well thought of. big part of uh, his discovery is displayed in uh, the British Natural History Museum, of course, uh, in the Bucharest uh, Museum as well, natural history, and he was made a mm, member of the uh, uh, Academy of Sciences of Romania. And he also was knighted by King Carol as a knight of Romania. So this picture is, uh, we have two, two pictures here, one from probably the 1880s, and the other one is later, uh, he died uh, in, was it 1922? So his, this is probably in the 1910s, 19 teens, uh, picture with his grandchildren. Now let us move to the next slide. And here we have, uh, this is uh, very probably Louis August Montand, and it's quite uh, uh, plausible. Most likely this is Louis. Uh, now, Louis uh, was a Montandon uh, Jaco. Montandon Jaco is, is the genealogical branch, but he is mentioned very early in Davoin Almanacs, and uh, he was working at two principal locations for a very long time. During the 1848 uh, crisis in Neuchâtel, he formed as a member of the provisional government, and we see a picture uh, from this uh, poster that's celebrating this provisional government of 1848. This is probably uh, a photograph from later, perhaps the 1850s. But uh, this uh, Louis August uh, was a very interesting character. He married in Belgium at Mon, and uh, he was a watchmaker and a negociant. So. Uh, we find him living between 1806 and 1880. Now he was in La Chaux de Fond, and his watches are most likely those signed Louis Montandon à Genève, or Louis Montandon Genève, um, Geneva. So uh, these are most likely his watches. Uh, there is a, a Louis Montandon uh, La Chaux de Fond watch, and this also probably relates to him. So let us uh, move to the next slide. Once again, we have another uh, picture uh, from the same source. Now, Alphonse Montandon was the only Montandon watchmaker established in Travers. And uh, this, uh, he was doing watches between the uh, uh, circa 1846 to um, 1865. Uh, he's listed up until this point, actually he's listed in 1866, Davoin Almanac, however, the village of Traverse was utterly destroyed by a fire in the uh, late autumn of 1865. So all of Alphonse's tools most likely burned up. After that time, we no longer find him in Davoin Almanacs. Now his brother, who is pictured here, Louis Edward Montandon, originally uh, uh, was a businessman. He went and did business with uh, New Orleans. In New Orleans, he was uh, exporting cotton from America and uh, most likely importing Swiss watches. And some of these watches may have been his brother's uh, creations. So he was a businessman in the beginning. We find him later uh, in the 1840s and 1850s mentioned uh, as having business interests in Alabama. So he was clearly, um, focused in this southern area of the United States. Now, when the village of uh, Traverse burned, his brother Alphonse, uh, at this time, Louis Edward, was um, part of the public safety uh, committee, and he was in charge of all the uh, public uh, works for uh, Neuchâtel. So the village of Traverse, uh, this pamphlet that was authored by his brother Alphonse, the watchmaker, uh, this was supported by Louis Edward, who was in the government at the time. 
he became a government member. However, he was, uh, as early as 1848, involved with the provisional government, and it's where, at this time, where we see him rising. He was very pro-Republican, and he, in fact, even um, called out another, uh, Jean-Louis Montandon, who was a government uh, official for um, flying the Prussian flag at uh, government buildings during the visit of the Prussian monarch. This was later used uh, as a reason to remove him from that post. So we have these uh, royalist and republican passions playing out here, but this is a very interesting character, very wealthy family. Uh, this would have been necessary to have been an établisseur, as Alphonse was, because it cost money to obtain the gold and the silver for these uh, watch objects. Now, Alph Alphonse made very beautiful watch objects, a uh, very beautiful cylinder, and uh, uh, even some very complicated pieces as well. There is an example of a complicated, uh, uh, multiple complications chronometer that uh, he uh, made with um, uh, basically ringing the, the hour, uh, this type of thing. So let us move to the next slide. And this was Montaigne de Traverse. Genealogical branch once again. Now, this individual, and this is a question mark. This is a highly likely. This is suspected to be Charles Albert Montandon. Now, Charles Albert Montandon was the last owner of Montandon First Law Club. His father, uh, Charles uh, Adolf Montandon, uh, was the main uh, head of the Law Club branch until. He died, and then Albert uh, took over. Now, um, uh, the heyday of Montana First Local was under the father, and we do see that uh, Charles Albert uh, was, after the uh, in the very last years of his father's life, seeking a way out as the pressure from American watch factories was so great on Swiss makers that. Uh, it was becoming a, a very big struggle to uh, succeed in this environment as Americans were producing, mass producing, high quality pieces at very low cost. So uh, Charles Albert closed down the branch by 1887-1888 of Montana and Furs. Uh, there was an auction of over 6,000 watch movements, watches and such. These were all uh, uh, liquidated. Now, he moved to the Dominican Republic and established the largest cocoa plantation in the Caribbean. This is a very a huge feat. They put in a 10 kilometer uh, long telephone line, established a monorail to the river, so they were able to uh, ship their uh, cocoa products to uh, the port where they were loaded, and they were supplying chocolate, uh, this cocoa, to uh, Rus Souchard, who was like the largest uh, Swiss uh, chocolate maker at the time. So it was very interesting, it was very bold, very daring, but this picture is suspected uh, Charles Albert. He is clearly uh, a high-ranking person, and this was taken at the plantation, the colony, uh, there were two colonies, one was Helvetia, and that was run by the Decombe family, or Jacques, Jacques Decombe, which was an allied family of Charles Albert. Uh, Montendo, uh, and the other colony was Evolution, and this was taking at Evolution, and here we see an individual who is clearly very dignified, uh, very uh, powerful individual. He's on the horse, he's got a pistol, a machete, and a, 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 a large firearm, a shotgun, or, or some sort of uh, um, hunting <laughs> weapon, but this was necessary in the Dominican Republic in those days. This was uh, taken probably in the late 1880s or early 1890s. Now the country was run by a junta, a dictatorship, and in 1890 this dictator that was supporting this colony was overthrown, and uh, so this was a sort of a Wild West uh, situation that you really had to protect your assets. Very interesting story. This is uh, most likely him. Uh, it's it's uh, the fact that uh, it was taken at that plantation, uh, the colony of Evolucion, and he seems to be the most regal individual. Uh, it, it's very likely that this is him, and from him we can also see 
uh, his father perhaps in his image is Charles Adolf. This is likely Charles Albert, uh, Montaigne and Blaise Lyon. So moving to the next slide we have uh, now James Montandon was one of the original uh, brothers of the Montandon Frères Lochla. Now he was originally uh, working in Paris with the brothers and at some point moved back. He was uh, in saint Emile, uh also in Neuchâtel and in Lochla at various times. His son James became a very powerful banker and the postcard is uh, the, uh, the son of James, also James Montandon, living at Colombier. And this postcard, postcard is uh, from the early 1900s, around 1912, 1911, somewhere around there. Uh, it is actually uh, hinting, uh, it actually indirectly mentions James's son, who is pictured here, and that is uh, George Montandon or George Alexis. Montandon. Now he was the grandson of James of Montana Ferris. Now this individual uh, has a very notorious uh, reputation. Now, he was uh, uh, a medical doctor, a surgeon, uh, who during the World First World War he served in France, uh, treating French soldiers in in the trench-like conditions. And after World War One ended, uh, ended up getting a post with the uh, Red Cross and he traveled all of Russia. Uh, basically, he was in charge of extricating Austrian and Hungarian prisoners of war, which he managed to extricate, uh, 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 was it 20 to 30,000 uh, prisoners of war across Russia on the Trans-Siberian Express, and he hired a boat out of Vladivostok and removed these individuals, and uh, very, um, very controversial. He broke every rule in the book. His mandate on, on it, for the Red Cross did not <laughs> did not uh, permit any of these actions. However, he um, acted on very bold authority. He was from a rich and powerful family, and obviously he felt very entitled. Now later, this would come back to haunt him when he returned to Switzerland in the early 1920s. By the mid 1920s, he had gone through a series of uh, legal cases with uh, uh, various different journalists that he had attacked and um, he ended up turning his back on Switzerland and he went to France. Now before this, before World War One, he had been traveling the world as a, an anthropologist and he was an explorer. Um, he went to almost all of the continents uh, researching various different uh, ethnic groups and he became an ethnic uh, very interested in ethnology and anthropology and there is from the 1930s a hoax of this monkey uh, that was supposedly a missing link that is associated with some of his theories. Now he became very tied up in these race theories and he became a member. Uh, he was an anthropologist working in Paris and uh, during the Nazi regime he was collaborating with them and issuing various certificates of ethnicity uh, for which huge amounts to the tune of 500 francs were demanded. And if this could not be paid, then the person was con considered Jewish. So these were, he became very, uh, his story ended very tragically uh, with, he seems to have gone down the wrong road. And uh, he was assassinated by the French resistance in 1944. Uh, the resistance members entered his house. His wife was a Russian lady and she was killed and uh, he was wounded severely and managed to dial the ambulance. And later he was evacuated to Germany where approximately a month later he succumbed, succumbed to his wounds in uh, Germany at a hospital. But uh, a very controversial individual and uh, uh, nevertheless we may have a window with his picture, uh, once again, family resemblance to James Montana, the watchmaker, his grandfather. So moving on to the next slide. We have this Charles Fritz, who went by the name of Fritz uh, Montana. And uh, Fritz, also uh, Swiss born uh, in the area of Le Pont de Martel, 
He was a Montana de Travel. Uh, he was a watchmaker. Now it's not exactly clear which uh, uh, specialization he had. He probably was working with uh, cases, uh, bo uh, box, watch boxes, and what, what he is something of this variety, perhaps. He was another technical specialist t having to do with movements or gears. This is it's not exactly clear. However, he did immigrate to the United States, and uh, this picture is around the time of his immigration. This is dating from the 1880s. Now, he died in Idaho, in the US, uh, USA. So he was a watchmaker, and later, as many uh, uh, moved to the US, they went into farming, and that's exactly what he did. So this is a picture of Fritz von Tenden. Now we are moving into the story of Louis Alfred von Tenden. Now, Louis Alfred went by the name of Alfred, Alfred von Tenden, and he was a, also a von de Traverse. And in Switzerland, uh, he would have been working as a boitier, that's a case maker. Now he did immigrate to the United States in 1887, late 1887 or late 1888, winter, and uh, he took all of his children with him, and now he stayed in the, in the United States until his first wife died in 1911, and around 1912 we see him going back to Switzerland, and he repatriated back to Switzerland, and he remained there until he died in 1930. So. Uh, we do have him in Switzerland and in uh, Iowa in the United States. He originally went to Illinois, but eventually settled in Iowa before repatriating to Switzerland. And we see in the picture here, his house, this is house picture is dated from approximately 1921. So uh, this house, I did locate this house. This is my great grandfather and very typical, very big resemblance Montana de Traverse. Uh, so this is very uh, interesting and dear pictures. Let us go to the next watchmaker. So Camille or Camille Louis Montandon uh, was one of the brothers of Montana First Locla and we do not uh, have his picture. However, he was one of the major individuals indicated by as an owner of uh, Montana First Lokla. This is indicated by a very famous scholar who was a al allied member, Allié, who married uh, one of the daughters of Charles Frederick Montandon. That's the father of the brothers of uh, Montana First Lokla. So uh, his son, now Camille, his son was Henri Montandon, who lived in saint Emile and he became an architect. And the son's son is uh, this picture individual, uh, Raoul Montandon. Now, this is a very interesting character. Now, Raoul was a twin, and uh, many uh, of the previous watchmaker uh, that we sp spoke of, uh, Louis Alfred, he had twins, and very big uh, uh, repeating theme in the Montana de Traverse is the um, plurality of twins in the family. So uh, Raoul was a twin. He had a twin sister. Uh, she died rather young. Uh, I believe she was in her 20s. However, uh, uh, and I myself am a twin, but uh, we, we do see this in one of the Montana de, uh, de Traverse families had, of all the children, they had 17 children of which there were three sets of twins. So we see this uh, happening very common genetic uh, quality in the, the branch, this branch's um, affiliation. But this Raoul, uh, he is the uh, grandson of Camille of Montenegro's. And uh, this is another Blaise Leon. Uh, Blaise Leons are, tend to be the most illustrious. Now, this individual also became a knight uh, of the Legion of Honor, a Chevalier de la Legion d'Honneur. Uh, now he was granted this uh, as, a, a work, as his work related. He was originally trained as an architect, like his father only. However, he also went into ancient history and uh, archaeology, and he did an exhaustive work of genealogical, or rather, excuse me, uh, archaeological uh, 
studies uh, research of, of, of places around the geography of France. And this massive work was um, so exhaustive and deep that he was uh, uh, honored with this uh, knighthood. Now, he was also a member of the uh, Geographic Society of Geneva. He was, he was its president for a long time. And in his later years, during the 1930s uh, and 40s, we find a lot of, he published many, many books, and he began to pursue um, a deep interest in parapsychology. And so we see a lot of spiritual works. Uh, this was very popular in the 1920s especially, but he obviously became interested in this. But he was a humanitarian. He's a very close cousin of this uh, 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 George Alexis Montana, this George Montana, who was a very bad individual. This individual is a very good individual. He, he was very humanitarian. Uh, he prepared a very good report for the Red Cross um, uh, on the uh, on, on natural disasters and how to prevent them uh, around the world. Uh, this was a report that they requested in uh, this is often re 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 um, referred to, uh, but uh, his works uh, on parapsychology are very interesting. He has many, many of these works, but he tried to spend his uh, life uh, devoting it towards the good of uh, mankind and to his uh, society, in which he is uh, remembered very well. But this is a picture that's probably from the 1940s uh, of him, but this also gives us a window into the family uh, uh, genealogy, the, the pictures, uh, the imagery of these watchmakers. Now, this he does look quite uh, close to, uh, it will be uh, remembered, uh, this Charles Albert suspected picture. There is a family resemblance there between these, the, they, have, they have very prominent features on their face, the noses, the foreheads, and the cheeks, and this is another reason why that is probably Charles Albert, we can see a close family resemblance. But at any rate, this was, uh, and I do wanted to say uh, that uh, the fact that we have so few pictures, I have discovered that so few di pictures of these watchmakers, their family members, that it, it is almost necessary to use postcards when anchoring these uh, individuals in history based on their locations, because uh, there's a, there's a a material uh, lack of this photography due to the um, the fact that they were so early that before the invent of the camera so this is a little bit of a window into these watchmakers their families and I hope that this was of interest uh, to you because this um, gives us uh, a picture of with whom we're having uh, this uh, business of these watches and this watch story. So I hope you find it interesting or fascinating as I do. And uh, I, if, if anybody has pictures that they can share of uh, Montanans that they may be related to or any images from their own collections, it would be um, uh, an honor and a privilege to receive these. And this must be uh, no, notated for, and documented for the record. So uh, let us uh, let us finish with that positive note and thank you for your attention. Bye bye.